perspective on the sea. It has been shown in section 1, pages 25 to 34, that the law of perspective as commonly taught in our schools of art is fallacious and contrary to everything seen in nature. If an object be held up in the air and gradually carried away from an observer who maintains his position, it is true that all its parts will converge to one and the same point. But if the same object be placed upon the ground and similarly moved away from a fixed observer, the same predicate is false. In the first case, the center of an object is the datum to which every point of the exterior converges. But in the second case, the ground becomes the datum, in and towards which every part of the object converges in succession, beginning with the lowest or that nearest to it. Instances. A man with light trousers and black boots walking along a level path will appear at a certain distance as though the boots had been removed and the trousers brought in contact with the ground. A young girl with short garments terminating 10 or 12 inches above the feet will, in walking forward, appear to sink towards the earth, the space between which and the bottom of the clothes will appear to gradually diminish. And in the distance of half a mile, the limbs, which were first seen for 10 or 12 inches, will be invisible. The bottom of the garment will seem to touch the ground. A small dog running along will appear to gradually shorten by the legs, which in less than half a mile will be invisible, and the body appear to glide upon the earth. Horses and cattle moving away from a given point will seem to have lost their hooves and to be walking upon the outer bones of the limbs. Carriages similarly receding will seem to lose that portion of the rim of the wheels which touches the earth. The axles will seem to get lower, and at the distance of a few miles, the body will appear to drag along in contact with the ground. This is very remarkable in the case of a railway carriage when moving away upon a straight and level portion of line several miles in length. These instances, which are but a few of what might be quoted, will be sufficient to prove beyond the power of doubt or the necessity or controversy that upon a plane or a horizontal surface the lowest part of bodies receding from a given point of observation will disappear before the higher. This is precisely what is observed in the case of a ship at sea, when outward bound, the lowest part, the hull, disappearing before the higher parts, the sails and masthead. Abstractedly, when the lowest part of a receding object thus appears by entering the vanishing point, it could be seen again to any and every extent by a telescope, if the power were sufficient to magnify at the distance observed. This is to a great extent practicable upon smooth horizontal surface as upon frozen lakes or canals, and upon long straight lines of railway. But the power of restoring such objects is greatly modified and diminished, where the surface is undulating or otherwise movable, as in large and level meadows and pasture lands generally, in the vast prairies and grassy plains of America and especially so upon the ocean, where the surface is always more or less an undulating condition. In Holland and other level countries, persons have seen in winter, skating upon the ice at distances varying from 10 to 20 miles, on some of the straight and, quote, level lines, end quote, of railway which cross the prairies of America, the trains have been observed for more than 20 miles, but upon the sea, the conditions are altered, and the hull of a receding vessel can only be seen for a few miles, and this will depend very greatly, the altitude of the observer being the same upon the state of the water. When the surface is calm, the hull may be seen much farther than when it is rough and stormy, but under ordinary circumstances, when to the naked eye the hull has just become invisible, or is doubtfully visible, it may be seen again distinctly by the aid of a powerful telescope, although abstractedly or mathematically there should be no limit to this power of restoring by a telescope a lost object upon a smooth horizontal surface. Upon the sea this limit is soon observed. The water being variable in its degree of agitation, the limit of sight over its surface is equally variable, as shown by the following experiments. In May 1864, on several occasions when the water was unusually calm, from the landing stairs of Victoria Pier at Portsmouth, and from an elevation of two feet eight inches above the water, 
the greater part of the whole of the NAB lightship was, through a good telescope, distinctly visible. But on other experiments being made, when the water was less calm, no portion of it could be seen from the same elevation, notwithstanding that the most powerful telescopes were employed. At other times, half the hull and sometimes only the upper part of the bulk works were visible. If the hull had been invisible from the rotundity of the earth, the following calculation will show that it should at all times have been 24 feet below the horizon. The distance of the light ship from the pier is 8 statute miles. The elevation of the observer being 32 inches above the water would require 2 miles to be deducted as the distance of the supposed convex horizon. For the square of 2 multiplied by 8 inches, the fall in the first mile of the Earth's curvation equals 32 inches. This is deducted from the 8 miles. We'll leave 6 miles as the distance from the horizon to the ship. Hence, 6 squared times 8 inches equals 288 in inches or 24 feet. The top of the bulwarks, it was said, rose about 10 feet above the water line, hence deducting 10 from 24 feet. Under all circumstances, even had the water been perfectly smooth and stationary, the top of the hole should have been 14 feet below the summit of the arc of water or beneath the line of sight. This one fact is entirely fatal to the doctrine of the Earth's rotundity, but such facts have been observed in various other places. The Northwest Lightship in Liverpool Bay, and the light vessels of many other channels near the southern, eastern, and western shores of Great Britain. From the beach of South Sea Common near Portsmouth, the observer lying down near the water above the surface of which the eye was two and a half feet, and with a telescope looking across Spithead to the quarantine ship lying in the roads between Ride and Cows in the Isle of Wight, a distance of seven miles. The copper sheathing of that vessel was distinctly seen, the depth of which was about two feet. Making the usual calculation in accordance with the doctrine of the Earth's convexity, it will be seen that an arc of water ought to have existed between the two points, the summit of which arc should have been 16 feet above the copper sheathing of the vessel. From an elevation of two and a half feet above the water opposite the Royal Yacht Clubhouse in West Cowes, Isle of Wight, the pile work and promenade of the pier at Stokes Bay near Gosport, and nearly opposite Osborne House were easily distinguished through various telescopes. At the distance, the distance is seven miles, the altitude of the promenade ten feet, and the usual calculation will show that this pier ought to have been many feet below the horizon. It is a well-known fact that the light of the Eddystone Lighthouse is often plainly visible from the beach in Plymouth Sound, and sometimes when the sea is very calm, persons can see it distinctly when sitting in ordinary rowing boats, in that part of the sound which will allow the line of sight to pass between Drake's Island and the western end of the breakwater. The distance is 14 statute miles. In a list of lighthouses in a work called The Lighthouses of the World, by A. G. Findlay, FRGS, published in 1862, by Richard H. Lowry, 53, Flat Street, London. It said at page 28, quote, In the tables, the height of the flame above the highest tide high water level is given, so that it is the minimum range of the light. To this elevation, 10 feet is added for the height of the deck of the ship above the sea. Besides the increased distance to which low water will cause the light to be seen, the effect of refraction will also sometimes increase their range. In the tables above referred to, at page 36, the Eddystone light is said to be visible 13 miles. But these 13 miles are nautical measure, and as three nautical miles equal three and a half statute miles, the distance at which the Eddystone light is visible is over 15 statute miles, notwithstanding that the Eddystone light is actually visible at a distance of 15 statute miles, and admitted to be so both by the Admiralty authorities and by calculation according to the doctrine of rotundity, very often at the same distance, the lantern is not visible at an elevation of four feet from the water, showing that the law of perspective previously referred to is greatly influenced by the state of the surface water over which the line of sight is directed. A remarkable illustration of this influence was given in the Western Daily Mercury, published in Plymouth of October 25th, 1864. Several discussions had previously taken place at the Plymouth 
Athenium, and the Davenport Mechanics Institute on the true figure of the Earth, subsequent to which a committee was formed for the purpose of making experiments bearing on the question at issue. The names of the gentlemen as given in the above-named journal were, quote, Parallax, the author of this work, Theta, Mr. Henry, a teacher in Her Majesty's Dockyard, Devonport, and Monsignor Osborne Richards, Ricard, Mogg, Evers, and Pierce, all of Plymouth. From the report published as above stated, the following quotation is made. Observation 6. Quote, On the beach, at five feet from the water, the eddy stone was entirely out of sight. End quote. The matter may be summarized as follows. At any time, when the sea is calm and the weather clear, the light of the eddy stone, which is 89 feet above the foundation on the rock, may be distinctly seen from an elevation of five feet above the water level. According to the Admiralty directions, it, quote, may be seen 13 nautical or 15 statute miles, end quote, or one mile still further away than the position of the observers on the above-named occasion. And yet, on that occasion, and at a distance of only 14 statute miles, quotes coming from Lighthouses of the World, page 36, and at a distance of only 14 statute miles, notwithstanding that it was a very fine autumn day, and a clear background existed, not only was the lantern, which is 89 feet high, not visible, but the top of the vane, which is 100 feet above the foundation, was, as stated in the report, entirely out of sight. That vessels and lighthouses are sometimes more distinctly seen than at others, and that the lower parts of such objects are sooner lost sight of when the sea is rough than when it is calm, are items in the experience of seafaring people as common as their knowledge of the changes in the weather, and prominence is only given here to the above case because it was verified by persons of different opinions upon the subject of the Earth's form, and in the presence of several hundreds of the most learned and respectable inhabitants of the Plymouth and the neighborhood. The conclusion which such observations necessitate and force upon us is that the law of perspective, which is everywhere visible on land, is modified when observed in connection with objects upon or near the sea. But how modified? If the water of the ocean were frozen and at perfect rest, any object upon its surface would be seen as far as a telescope or magnifying power could be brought to bear upon it. But because this is not the case, because the water is always more or less in motion, not only of progression but of fluctuation, the swells and waves into which the surface is broken operate to prevent the line of sight from passing parallel to the horizontal surface of the water. It has been shown at pages uh, 16 to 20, also 25 to 33, section 1, that the surface of the earth and sea appears to rise up to the level or altitude of the eye, and that at a certain distance the line of sight and the surface which is parallel to it appear to converge to a vanishing point which is the horizon. If this horizon or vanishing point were formed by the apparent junction of two perfectly stationary parallel lines, it could be penetrated by a telescope of sufficient power to magnify at the distance, but because upon the sea the surface of the water is not stationary, the line of sight at the vanishing point becomes angular instead of parallel, and telescopic power is of little avail in restoring objects beyond this point. The following diagram will render this clear. Section 13, figure 1. So the following diagram will render this clear. The horizontal line CDE and the line of sight AB are parallel to each other and appear to meet at the vanishing point B. But at and about this point, the line AB is intercepted by the undulating or fluctuating surface of the water, the degree of which is variable, being sometimes very great and other times inconsiderable, and having to pass over the crest of the waves as at H is obliged to become AH instead of AB, and will therefore fall upon a ship, lighthouse, or other object at the point S, or higher or lower as such objects are more or less beyond the point H.
it is worthy of note that the waves at the point H, whatever their real magnitude may be, are magnified and rendered more obstructive by the very instrument, the telescope, which is employed to make the objects beyond more plainly visible, and thus the phenomenon is often very strikingly observed that while a powerful telescope will render the sails and rigging of a ship when beyond the point H, or the optical horizon, so distinct that the very ropes are easily distinguished, not the slightest portion of the hull can be seen. The, quote, crested waters, end quote, form a barrier to the horizontal line of sight as substantial as would the summit of an intervening rock or island. In the report which appeared in the Western Daily Mercury of October 25, 1864, the following observations were also recorded. Quote, on the seafront of the camera house, and at an elevation of 110 feet from the mean level of the sea, a plain mirror was fixed by the aid of a plumb line in a true vertical position. In this mirror, the distant horizon was distinctly visible on a level with the eye of the observer. This was the simple fact as observed by the several members of the committee which had been appointed. But some of the observers remarked that the line of the horizon in the mirror rose and fell with the eye, as also did everything else which was reflected, and that this ought to be recorded as an addendum. Granted, the surface of the sea appeared to regularly ascend from the base of the hoe to the distant horizon. The horizon from the extreme east to the west, as far as the eye could see, was a parallel to a horizontal line. End quote. The following version was recorded in the same journal of the same date, and was furnished by one of the committee, who had manifested a very marked aversion to the doctrine that the surface of all water is horizontal. Quote, a vertical looking glass was suspended from the camera, and the horizon seen in it, as well as various other objects reflected, rising and falling with the eye. The water was seen in the glass to ascend from the base of the hoe to the horizon. The horizon appeared parallel to a horizontal line, end quote. It will be observed that the two reports are substantially the same and very strongly corroborate the remarks made at pages 15, 16, and 17, the beginning of section 1. Indeed, no other report could have been given without the authors becoming subject to the charge of glaring, obstinate, and willful misrepresentation. What then has again been demonstrated? Well, that the surface of all water is horizontal, and that, therefore, the earth cannot possibly be anything other than a plane. All appearances to the contrary have been shown to be purely optical and adventitious. Another proof that the surface of the water is horizontal and that therefore the earth cannot be a globe is furnished by the following experiment, which was made in May 1864 on the new pier of South Sea near Portsmouth. Section 13, image 2. A telescope was fixed upon a stand and directed across the water at Spithead to the pierhead at Ride in the Isle of Wight as shown in the subjoined diagram. The line of sight crossed a certain part of the funnel of one of the regular streamers trading between Portsmouth and the Isle of Wight, and it was observed to cut or fall upon the same part during the whole of the passage to Ride Pier, thus proving that the water between the two piers is horizontal because it was parallel to the line of sight from the telescope fixed at South Sea. If the earth were a globe, the channel between Ride and South Sea would be an arc of a circle, and, as the distance across is four and a half statute miles, the center of the arc would be 40 inches higher than the two sides, and the steamer would have ascended an inclined plane for two and a quarter miles, or to the center of the channel, and afterwards descended for the same distance towards Ride. This ascent and descent would have been marked by the line of sight falling 40 inches nearer to the deck of the streamer when on the center of the arc of water, as represented in the following diagram. This is section 13, number 3. But as the line of sight did not cut the steamer lower down when in the center of the channel and no such ascent and descent was observed, it follows necessarily that the surface of the water between South Sea and the Isle of Wight is not convex, and therefore the earth as a whole is not a globe. The evidence against the doctrine of the earth's rotundity is so clear and perfect, 
and so completely fulfills the conditions required in special and independent investigations that it is impossible for any person who can put aside the bias of previous education to avoid the opposite conclusion that the earth is a plane. This conclusion is greatly confirmed by the experience of mariners in regard to certain lighthouses. Where the light is fixed and very brilliant, it can be seen at a distance, which the present doctrine of the Earth's rotundity would render altogether impossible. For the instance, at page 35 of Lighthouses in the World, the Ride Pier Light, erected in 1852, is described as a bright fixed light 21 feet above the high water and visible from an altitude of 10 feet at the distance of 12 nautical or 14 statute miles. The altitude of 10 feet would place the horizon at the distance of four statute miles from the observer. The square of the remaining 10 statute miles multiplied by eight inches will give a fall or curvature downwards from the horizon of 66 feet. Deduct from this 21 feet, the altitude of the light, and we have 45 feet as the amount which the light would ought to be below the horizon. By the same authority, at page 39, the Bidston Hill Lighthouse near Liverpool is 228 feet above high water, one bright fixed light visible 23 nautical or very nearly 27 statute miles, deducting 4 miles for the height of the observer squaring the remaining 23 miles and multiplying that product by 8 inches, we have a downward curvature of 352 feet. From this, deduct the altitude of the light to 28 feet, and there remains 124 feet as the distance which the light should be below the horizon. Again, at page 40, quote, the lower light on the calf of man is 282 feet above the high water and is visible 23 nautical miles, end quote. The usual calculation will show that it ought to be 70 feet below the horizon. At page 41, the Cromer light is described as having an altitude of 274 feet above high water and is visible 23 nautical miles, whereas it ought to be, at that distance, 78 feet below the horizon. At page 9 it said, quote, The coal fire, which once was used, on the Spurn Point Lighthouse at the mouth of the Humber, which, is, which was constructed on a good principle for burning, has been seen 30 miles off. If the miles here given are nautical measure, they would be equal to 35 statute miles. Deducting 4 miles as the usual amount for the distance of the horizon, there will remain 31 miles, which is squared and multiplied by 8 inches, and will give 640 feet as the declination of the water from the horizon to the base of the lighthouse, the altitude of which is given at page 42 as 93 feet above high water. This amount deducted from the above 640 feet would still leave 547 feet as the distance at which the spurn light ought to have been below the horizon. The two high Whitby lights are 240 feet above high water, see page 42, and are visible 23 nautical miles at sea. The proper calculation will be 102 feet below the horizon. At page 43, it is said that the lower Farne Island light is visible for 12 nautical or 14 statute miles, and the height above high water is 45 feet. The actual calculation will show that this light ought to be 67 feet below the horizon. The Heckingen light on the west coast of Norway, see page 54, is 66 feet above high water and visible 16 statute miles. It ought to be sunk beneath the horizon 30 feet. The Tajum light, see page 55, on the Ringham Rock, west coast of Norway, is 51 feet high and is visible at 16 statute miles, but ought to be 45 feet below the horizon. The Rondo light, also the west coast of Norway, see page 55, is 161 feet high and is visible for 25 statute miles. The proper calculation will prove that it ought to be above 30, 130 feet below the horizon. The Egero light on west point of island, south coast of Norway, see page 56, and which is fitted up with the first order of the dioptric lights, is visible for 28 statute miles, and the altitude above high water is at 154 feet. Making the usual calculation, we find this light ought to be depressed or sunk below the horizon 230 feet. The Dunkirk light on the north coast of France, see page 71, is 194 feet high and visible to 28 statute miles. The ordinary calculation will show that it ought to be 190 feet below the horizon. 
The Gulf Air Bay Light on the west coast of France is said at page 77 to be visible 31 statute miles and to have an altitude of high water of 276 feet. At the distance given, it ought to be 210 feet below the horizon. Page 78, the Cordonon Light on the river Garande, west coast of France, is given as being visible 31 statute miles and is altitude 207 feet, which would give its depression below the horizon as nearly 280 feet. The Light at Madras, page 104, on the Esplanade is 132 feet high and visible 28 statute miles, whereas at the distance it ought to be beneath the horizon above 250 feet, or should say greater than 250 feet below the horizon. The Port Nicholson Light in New Zealand, erected in 1859, page 110, is visible 35 statute miles. The altitude is 420 feet above high water and ought, if the water is convex, to be 220 feet below the horizon. The light on Cape Bonavista, Newfoundland, is 150 feet above high water and visible 35 statute miles, page 111. This will give on calculation for the Earth's rotundity 491 feet that the light should be below the horizon. Many other cases could be given from the same work, showing that the practical observations of mariners, engineers, and surveyors entirely ignore the doctrine that the Earth is a globe. The following cases taken from miscellaneous sources will be interesting as bearing upon and leading to the same conclusion. In the Illustrated London News of October 20th, 1849, engraving is given of a new lighthouse erected on the Irish coast. The accompanying descriptive matter contains the following sentence. Ballycotton Island rises 170 feet above the level of the sea. The height of the lighthouse is 60 feet, including the lantern, giving the light an elevation of 230 feet, which is visible upwards of 35 miles to sea. If the 35 miles are nautical measure, the distance in statute miles would be over 40 miles, and allowing the usual distance for the horizon, there would be 36 miles from thence to the lighthouse. The square of 36 multiplied by 8 inches amounts to 864 feet. Deduct the total altitude of the lantern, 230 feet, and the remainder, 634 feet, is the distance which the light of Ballycotton ought to be below the horizon. In the Times newspaper of Monday, October 16, 1854, in an account of Her Majesty's visit to Great Grimsey from Hull, the following paragraph occurs. Quote, their attention was, first, naturally directed to a gigantic tower which rises from the center pier to the height of 300 feet and can be seen 60 miles out to sea, end quote. The 60 miles, if nautical, and this is always understood when referring to distances at sea, would make 70 statute miles to which the fall of 8 inches belongs, and as all observations at sea are considered to be made at an elevation of 10 feet above the water, for which four miles must be deducted from the whole distance, 66 statute miles will remain, the square of which, multiplied by 8 inches, gives a declination towards the tower of 2,904 feet. Deducting from this the altitude of the tower 300 feet, we obtain the startling conclusion that the tower should be at the distance at which is visible 60 nautical miles, more than 2,600 feet below the horizon. The only modification which can be made or allowed in the preceding calculations is that for a refraction, which is considered by surveyors generally to amount to about one twelfth of the altitude of the object observed. If we make this allowance, it will reduce the various quotients by one twelfth, which is so little that the whole will be substantially the same. Take the last quotation as an instance. 2,600 feet divided by 12 gives 206, which deducted from 2,600 leaves 2,384 as the correct amount for refraction. End section 13. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video presentation. If you did, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, like the video, and share it on your favorite social media sites. There's a lot more to come, so stay tuned and we'll see you back next time.